Hi, welcome to This is Getting Old. I'm your host, Melissa B., PhD, and today we're going to be talking about nurses' representation in the healthcare media. So I'm joined today by Dr. Diana Mason. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Melissa, for having me be with you today. It's a pleasure. And so kind of where I got the idea of wanting to talk to you today was about um, the Woodhull study that was released. And about 20 years ago, they released the first one. So maybe you can tell um, people a little bit about that study, but also why this is important for the public to know about. And particularly if you're a journalist, why would this Woodhull study matter? Yes, thank you. Um, the original Woodhull study was a study conducted in 1997 uh, and published by Sigma Theta Tau Nursing uh, Honorary Society. Uh, and it came about because Nancy Woodhull, who was one of the original managing editors and co-founders of USA Today, had a health issue and uh, it was a nurse who advised her on what she ought to do to get it properly diagnosed. And she was someone who was concerned anyway about women's representation in the media and in newsrooms. And so she realized, wait a minute, why don't I hear nurses' voices in news media at all? And so there was this study that was done at the University of, of Rochester that looked at leading newspapers at the time, national and regionals, some news weeklies like Time and Newsweek, and some of our own trade publications like Modern Healthcare. And they did an analysis, and this was all print then, they did an analysis of to what extent were nurses' voices represented in the media, were they used as sources and cited or, or attributed to be sources. And they found that nurses were used as sources in only 4% of health news stories in these leading newspapers, and 1% in the news weeklies, and 1% in our own trade publications. Modern healthcare used nurses as sources in 0.6% of their stories. So it was a wake up call and I've paid attention to that. I've done work with media. I've done a radio program for over 35 years. I've been editor of the American Journal of Nursing. I sit on the, uh, the advisory committee for Kaiser Health News uh, and, and I'm, I blog and I do radio now. So I'm very interested in this issue because I know how important nurses voices are and how good we are with conveying information to the public. And so I was very interested in replicating this study 20 years later, and that's what we did. And I and a team of people uh, replicate as closely as possible the original Woodhall study, and we found that nurses were cited as sources in 2% of those newspapers. And we did, did better in, in, in news weeklies. It's up to 2%. In our own trade publications, it was still 1%. I mean, it really was abysmal. And while there's not a statistically significant difference between what they found in 1997 and what we found in 2017, uh, we, we say that nothing has changed, not that it's gotten worse, but nothing has changed. And interestingly enough, nurses were, were not used in stories on policy, even though repeal of the Affordable Care Act was a major topic of concern at the time. Nurses were rarely used as sources on a topic that wasn't about nursing. And so we were interested in, well, why is this? What are journalists' experiences with using nurses as sources? So we did a qualitative study using 10 healthcare, health journalists and found that indeed there are real biases about nurses, about women, and about positions of authority in healthcare that really get in the way of journalists using as sources, nurses as sources. For example, there are editorials, policies, and practices, including journalists repeatedly told us that if they use a nurse as a source on a non-nursing story, they have to justify that to their editor. The editors want the rock star doc as the expert. And in one case, a journalist said they were doing something around anesthesia and they interviewed a nurse anesthetist and the editor said, what, you couldn't find an anesthesiologist in the whole country? 
And what they didn't realize is that nurses are delivering the bulk of anesthesia care in this country and were the first anesthesia providers. So, so there are biases in newsrooms. There are also, the journalists said, they really don't understand what nurses do, what their roles are and what all of our degrees are. They also said, if I did want a nurse, I don't know how to find a nurse. So they know the medical societies to go to if they need a physician, they don't know where to go to find a nurse. And finally, oh, two other things. One was that when they went to public relations staff or communications staff at healthcare organizations like hospitals and the universities that have schools of nursing, and when they went to them and asked them for a source, they were never given a nurse as a source. Even if they asked for a nurse as a source, they sometimes would not be given one. So there's a lot of work around the public relations people's own biases and why that might be, as well as bias within these organizations about who are experts and who aren't. And finally, they said to us, nursing doesn't reach out to us. And they don't send us press releases on the important study that just came out. And so there's a lot on us as nurses to correct as well. But essentially, uh, we are, we are it, it not used as sources because uh, there are these biases about us as predominantly women's profession and about a misunderstanding or a lack of understanding of what nurses do. So it, it's, it's, uh, it, it was really enlightening. So I find this fascinating. Um, <laughs> this is the year of the nurse. The World Health Organization declared this the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife. Um, and, you know, this is the 200th anniversary of Florence Nightingale's um, birth. And the way she kind of brought nursing into its own was through using data and all of her writing and all of her publications. Um, I went to the Florence Nightingale Museum a couple of years ago in London and I was like, this lady is, was just proliferative. And it's the power of writing and getting your voice out there that gave birth to the whole thing. So Melissa, what people don't realize is that she did use the media enormously effectively because she had a contact with a reporter at the London Times and fed him her data and was able to get it on the front page of the London Times. And that's an example of frontline nurses, nurses who are on the front line. She was there in the Crimean War taking care of the soldiers, the British soldiers, in horrific conditions. And she was able to get the causes of mortality out to the, the British public, showing that it wasn't war injuries, it was unsanitary conditions, inadequate, inadequate environmental sanitation, inadequate food supplies. Uh, and so she was very astute in using the media. And, and it's actually something that's a good example for other journalists as well as for nurses to realize this is an important tool that we need to use as nurses. Yeah, and the other thing in kind of preparing to talk to you today is, um, you know, the nursing as a profession has been the most trusted profession by the American public for 18 years in a row. So that's a great response to an editor <laughs> of why would you interview a nurse? Yes, uh, although I think sometimes we're rated that way because we're seen as powerless. Uh, and I think we have to not take on the moniker of, oh, we're, we're just the quiet behind the scenes people. And there's a real issue there. Nurses have deep expertise, but we feel like because we might know, not know everything that somebody's gonna ask them, then we're not two experts. And uh, we, need, we need to get more realistic about that and get over that. So there's a lot that we can do, but, but I think it's really important that journalists and the public understand that as nurses, we have perspectives on things that nobody else has. Who else is with that patient 24 seven? Who else you know, knows about the biological, the psychological, the emotional, the social, the spiritual, and how people respond in those various dimensions when they are experiencing illness? Who knows better about some of the challenges of what happens when you cut a hospital budget? I had a reporter who, who told me, he's a leading reporter on the business of healthcare, and he emailed me and said he wasn't going to participate in, this, participate in the study because he didn't interview nurses. He covered the business of healthcare. And what he didn't realize is that the, CE, the chief nurse officer is probably the best person 
for that journalist to talk to about the impact of potential budget cuts, whether governmental budget cuts on healthcare or a hospital budget cut. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that nurse staffing, isn't that the biggest part of any hospital's budget? It is. The chief nurse usually has the biggest, and it isn't just nurse staffing. Many of these chief nurses are also vice president for patient care services. They have all these other services reporting to them. So uh, journalists and the public, and, and, and so here's the other thing. I believe it is nurses' social responsibility to share their expertise with the public. Nurses can tell you give you tips on how to cope with, improve your health and how to cope with illness, how to use the healthcare system, how to manage symptoms, how to get the emotional support for the person you love who, who is uh, suffering from an illness, or what it's like to support somebody at the end of life. And so I believe it's our responsibility to be going out to the public and to share what we know and, 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 and have learned but it's also incumbent, I think, on journalists to recognize that and help to get that voice to the public. And now, with the coronavirus pandemic, <laughs> is greater realization. And I'm seeing, because people are realizing it's nurses who are on that front line of care. They are at risk, their families are at risk. They are, we are dependent upon them to provide care to people. Um, and, and it, it, you know, depending upon how this virus is, how well we contain this virus, this could get very much out of hand in terms of healthcare organizations really being stretched beyond their capabilities to provide the care that will be needed. And so nurses' voices on what's going on, what they need and don't need. I'm hearing from nurses, for example, that they don't have adequate protective equipment. Mm -hmm. to, to protect them in this patient care situations. So, you know, what a better story uh, for a journalist than to know, to hear about uh, from a nurse who's saying, I don't have the protective equipment I need to provide safe care. If I get the virus and I have to stay home, that's one less nurse to provide care. Correct. So it, it's really an important time for the public to realize nurses can help you to think through what you should be doing around this, this uh, pandemic, um, but also that, that their voices in terms of what's happening in healthcare is really crucial to get perspective on what we need to do to be better prepared. Yeah, and I think even just through my social media, I've really enjoyed watching. I think for me, this is the first time I've really felt like I kind of came into my own about how I could use social media to get messages out there. And, you know, my colleague Karen Johnson is an associate professor at University of Texas, Austin, and she does public health. So I was watching her stuff and, I, and things that she was tweeting. And I was like, you know what? But my unique perspective is how this impacts older adults, which are considered a high risk and vulnerable population. So I've started putting things out. Um, you know, like what does social distancing even mean? You know, yes. what are the things, why, why are you at, at risk, greater risk because you're older, um, you know, to educate the public. And then it's really going to be about symptom management. Yes. After you do the social distancing and stay home, if you do get sick, you know, what do you need to have, what supplies you need to have on hand? And yeah. on that list still yet is not toilet paper, <laughs> <laughs> but I can't find any. And I'm like, I should have at least gotten a pack. <laughs> it could be May. <laughs> you know, we're going to a economy using toilet paper i'm told yeah or maybe paper towels and new toilet paper i don't know so but so i guess you know one of the things that we talked about before we um started recording today was you know what are some other examples of ways that we are seeing you know so even though the woodhall study didn't show such a great outcome what are some of the other things you've seen this week where nurses are in the media so, so we did that in 20, 2017, but we, my colleague Barbara Glickstein and I, and, and uh, a Christy West fan who was also on the study, we've been working very hard to raise this issue with journalists. So Barbara and I are both members of the Association for Healthcare Journalists, and we have colleagues there that we work very hard to say, we will provide you with nurses as sources on stories. And so we've been seeing an uptick. We've been blogging for journalists' blogs that they, you know, for the association um, and, and other groups um, where journalists pay attention to. So um, uh, that kind of, of outreach to journalists, I think, is, was paying off even before the coronavirus. 
but now I think I think that's paid off in terms of journalists realizing there are really good stories and really important stories that nurses have. So we're seeing an uptick like last night I watched 60 Minutes, who had three public health nurses on from up in New Rochelle, where there has been really a, 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 an outbreak that they're now really trying to contain. And they have been going door to door, reaching out to contacts. And what the, the reporter learned from those nurses, only those nurses could have provided. So he went with them and, and they were able to show what these nurses were doing. And, uh, uh, this past weekend, Eileen Sullivan Marks, who's the Dean at the College of Nursing at New York University was on MSNBC uh, talking about what people could do to minimize spread of the coronavirus as well as the reduce the likelihood that they or their family would get it and of course she's an expert in aging as well as you and so um, that's really important information to get out there given that older adults as we know are really at risk uh, so so i'm i'm pleased with what i'm seeing and i'm also hearing from nursing organizations that journalists are really flooding them with requests to speak to nurses now one of the problems is that nurses are really reluctant who are on the front lines to speak and they can't do so and keep their jobs and identify them if they identify themselves with a particular healthcare organization and don't go through the public relations department. Mm -hmm. So you, 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 they would have to get permission as anybody should working for a healthcare organization. Most of them have policies. You have to get permission to speak to media. And, uh, but I would encourage them to do that. And I would encourage the chief nurse officer to make sure that the public relations department is not only prepared to approve those, those requests, but is actually looking at opportunities to have nurses speak uh, uh, to, to journalists and to the public about what they're seeing and what they're doing. I think it's really important for the public to understand how serious this is. So do you think that's true for physicians also? Would a physician not make a comment for fear of getting fired? My, ex my experience in talking with physicians is that physicians have their own uh, uh, code of conduct, if you will, around media, and particularly rock star physicians. They just go ahead and talk to the media without getting a prior approval. Um, and I, I do know some physicians who say that they would need to get approval from the organization and they are employed by the organization. Um, so, but you depend more on the organization they work, work for rather than your discipline. It, it's, it's more on the organization they work for and their status within that organization. If you're a rock star doc, they don't care. You can breach that media thing and they're not going to get rid of you. They are not. Whereas if a nurse breaches it, now right now they might not get rid of the nurse because they right. need <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah, nurses fear for their jobs if they violate that protocol. Well, one of the other things that I was you know, reading in the Woodhull study also is that there are gaps in where our voices are being heard in yes. opinion pieces, editorials. But that's changing. It is changing. Yes. Like Karen, Karen had a great op-ed op and like um, something down here around broadening the, the talk of, about health policy to more than just healthcare insurance. Yes. So, you know, I did the op-ed project and Mona Chattel at Hopkins has done the same thing. Exactly. So, so th there's a lot of optimism that we are beginning to own our voice and to kind of come into our own. Yes. And, Probably because and, of all the work that you've done. <laughs> well, but it's also interesting that, that we're, we're, we are ramping up in writing commentaries and blogs and op-eds. And uh, yeah, I give credit, not just to Mona Chattel, but to um, the Dean at Rush University at the time when they brought in the op-ed project. That was quite visionary uh, uh, to do. However, it's and very- you can, do that, you can actually do that without being, yes. going through an organization. I did it independently, so. What's interesting though, is that that's the mechanism that in which you're going to have most control. So the idea of a nurse being interviewed by somebody else for radio or for television or even a video podcast like this is scary to too many nurses and, and for a variety of reasons. The uh, writing commentaries and blogs and op-eds, you feel safer. It's you controlling what you're putting out there, although it may be edited, but that's okay. 
so that's it's so an I interesting. Well, I don't know though. I think that's kind of a. I mean, even I've had to struggle with that. It's like if I write this up or I do this podcast project or I do whatever I do, like I'm putting myself out there, and people could be critical. Yes. And it's like, well. Yes. But you, that's just kind of part of it. You so that, if you think it's a good idea and it's gonna do good for the world, suck it up, princess. That's right. That's <laughs> right. I totally agree. If if you don't risk. Uh, take the risks and they're calculated risks. There are some places I will not blog for. There are some places I will not do television and radio for. I pay attention to the outlet. I want a credible outlet and I want an outlet that is not about sensationalism necessarily, but it's about getting information out to the public. So I do pay attention to those things. Um, but um, it, it's time for us to, yeah, uh, put on our big girl pants and uh, put ourselves out there. Oh, big boy. We, big boy, and be ready to take the heat. Uh, you have to be ready to take the heat. And I think that's one of the differences between nurses and physicians. In medical training, they are very much put on the spot. They have to be prepared to take the heat. And I think in nursing, we don't take that approach very much. We don't uh, help people to take the heat, to get shot at, if you will, um, because you've said something, and then figure out how to come back or how to deal with that. Yeah. Well, and I think also recognizing ourselves as thought leaders and, and really knowing what our unique contribution is. It's like I was telling you, like last week, I was like, I should totally do a podcast on the coronavirus. And you know, then I had to go back and I was like, because I had a lot of anxiety. It's like things are changing so rapidly that I actually have a disclaimer. It's like this was taken from the CDC and World Health Organization's websites on March 11th. Yes. You know, but I'm like, I still think that the content, I was talking more from the principal's perspective, like, yes, you're going to wear gloves, change them between your transactions, yeah. you know, um, so, oh, so that is one, go ahead. Well, just, I think an important point is one of the reasons it's so important for nurses to share their perspectives is because we talk to the public every day. And we know how to talk to the public. We know that, you know, you don't sit there and use a lot of highfalutin medical terms. You break it down for the person and meet them where they're at. That is so ingrained in nurses. And yeah, we do get jargony, but um, I I've had experience on my radio program where physicians come in and they just use all of this medical terminology and they've lost the audience. And then I've had a nurse jump in and reframe it and restate it in a way that the public will hear. So I think we also have to own our own expertise about communicating with the public. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of times when I'm even doing something, I'm like, you know, would my grandmother understand this? Yes. So it's like, if she's not gonna understand it, then there's really no point in me saying it if, it, if the point is to communicate with the public. Now, if I'm talking to a peer, that's different. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think that I am always thoughtful about that. So if a nurse you know, or somebody interested in going into nursing is, um, you know, wants to do more with the media, what are some recommendations you have for getting started? First of all, um, I, I highly recommend media training if you're feeling very scared because media training gives you the skills for feeling like you can control an interview and that you're not being forced into saying things that you really don't want to say. So I, I think that is key. I think it's also, if you have a public relations staff person in your organization, working with them, let them know what your expertise is. Work with them on what are the key messages you want to get out there and where are the media outlets that really would be interested in your perspective. Um, they can also coach you and rehearse with you if you're feeling anxious about it. I think it's crucial that we say to, to the people who are interviewing us or who are producing the piece, including the journalists, please make sure you identify me as a registered nurse. So I am Diana Mason, I am PhD RN, and I am a professor. And so that I could be identified as Dr. Diana Mason, a professor at George Washington University. And if they did that, they wouldn't know, the public wouldn't know that I'm a nurse. So I tell people, make sure that you say that I'm a registered nurse. If I'm writing a letter to the editor, to the New York Times, 
I'm saying to the, if you publish this letter, please make sure that you include that I'm a registered nurse in my signature. And they will now do that. We worked with the New York Times over the last 20 years since the first Woodhall study to get them to identify nurses as, as registered nurses. What most people don't realize is that uh, the news industry uses the um, style guide of the Associated Press, most media outlets. Okay. And that style guide says you do not use, you, you they are not permitted to use things like RN. It's not a degree, um, it, but we have gotten them to change from allowing nurses with PhDs or D, a doctorate of nursing practice to be referred to on second mention as Dr. Mason rather than just saying Mason or Ms. Mason, whereas before the style guide said only, you can only say doctor if it's an MD, an osteopath, a dentist, or a veterinarian. And those are the only people who, who we can say are doctors. So we've, there, there's been some change in that style guide as well. So we, we have to be proactive. Make sure you know I'm a registered nurse. And always be, you know, be, take advantage of the fact that you've got a little anxiety and and that uh, as nurses, we know how to breathe and that that anxiety will give you some energy and uh, that it's normal and just don't let it scare you away. True, because we do have a lot to say. I mean, I, even just some of the things that I've put out and I've seen my colleagues put out, there's been a lot of appreciation for nurses' voice on social media, trying to tell people how to manage symptoms, what to stock up on, how to take care of yourself, what true infection control looks like, you know, um, there's just, so I think that we need to con continue doing this and getting our voice out there. And I appreciate you being with me today. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And thank you for what you're doing. This is a great podcast. Well, you were the first one to call me when I told you I was doing the television show, The Inside Scoop. And so <laughs> I always appreciated your quick, like, Melissa, you need to know this. I, yeah. like, oh, I didn't even know I needed to know that. <laughs> So sometimes you can just start doing something and people will come to save you. So I've always appreciated that. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure. All right. Thank you for joining me today for This Is Getting Old. If you'd like to know more, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. And if you have any questions or a related topic you'd like to hear from me about, just let me know. Thanks.